I also thought, you know, if I if I get sick of walking through the you know the arches at your door, I'm, I'm going to have to give it away. I still love food. I love the execution of it. If you ask me, you know, like if I'm if I'm over it at all, it'd be like if I had you know boning salmon and boning ducks and quails. Yeah, that part of it, I can't. I don't love it to bits, but still, food generally excites me. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Dining out has changed a lot over the last few decades in Australia. Watching capital cities evolving at different rates in different ways. We've also seen regional dining capturing a sense of time and place too. Brisbane's food offering has changed exponentially in recent years. But there have been some chefs who have not only been an integral part of the evolution of the city's food, but are the beat of its culinary heart too. Philip Johnson is a chef and owner of Echo Bistro in Brisbane, Queensland. Philip, how are you going? Hi, how are you, Anthony? You've just recently celebrated 26 years um, with Echo Bistro. How does that feel? Oh, no, it's gone. It's gone quickly and it's been a a great journey. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's it. the, The years keep ticking past, but I'm sort of proud of what we've, what we've done, what we've achieved, and, and and how we've stood the test of time, I guess, you know. What was it like back in uh, 1995 when you first opened the doors? It set a scene for what the food uh, industry was like in Brisbane. Yeah, I guess if you go, if we just go back a little bit further, we had I had another restaurant called Le Bronx from 88 to 93, and we got into that business just, you know, wanting to be the, the best and you know to be fair we're in the top two or three in in brisbane i guess when we got out we sort of got out with um you know with not much except you know a great reputation and we sort of um and we found out that's all you had to get out with so you know because when we opened in 95 um we sort of you know people we built on that previous business but we got into the business from a very different reason like the the first business was costing us i don't know i think one or, one or two thousand a month and sort of laundry thought we've got to take out that so we had no tablecloths in the second business and we sort of got in for a far more business-like approach but you got to be careful what you wish for because you know a couple of years in we won restaurant of the year and it kind of snowballed from there but we did get in to try to make it a you know a business which We weren't going to work ourselves, you know, the chefs weren't going to have to work crazy hours and all that. But so we got in for a different reason, but ended up with a, with a great business. So that makes sense. What sort of food were you cooking back then in 1995 compared to now? Well, we, we sort of, I've been, when I sold uh, Le Bronx, which was a sort of a French based, you know, a French style restaurant, I went back to the UK. I'd worked in the UK sort of uh, 84, 80, 83 to 85, and I'd work for Anthony Worrell Thompson. I'd work for, for a couple of people and um, at a place actually called Menage a Trois, which was sort of, you know, became very famous because Lady Di ate there. It was really um, starters and desserts. And um, this, this, it was in Knightsbridge. And then um, when I came back, I had, I just wanted to do a re- um you know, a restaurant, and then we ended up with Le Bronx from 88 and 93. So and then, then I went back overseas, and um, before we opened Echo, I, again, I worked for a big sort of bistro called Deluga, which, again, just ironically was owned by Anthony Warren Thompson as well. And I sort of learned to do, you know, big numbers of, of bistro sort of food. So we were doing whole trays of confit duck and, you know, just do, not massive numbers, but, you know, being after confit 50 legs at a time, sort of bigger than what I'd done pre- previously. and what we tried to do was just sort of be, you know, what you see is what you get. So it was very sort of honest, honest food. And I think we were probably one of the first restaurants to sort of have no tablecloths. The chefs were, you know, we were obviously one of the very first restaurants just to wear butcher's aprons and and it was just people saw it for what it was and it was just great fruit, food, sorry, great food in an unintimidating um, environment. And whether you, you know, we I just had this, belief that whether you wanted to pop in for a, a warm salad or a bowl of soup, you got treated the same as whether you had a three-course meal. And it sort of, it, it grew from there. You're originally from New Zealand. What was food like for you as a kid? 
well, I kind of grew up in a, in a, in a, my parents had motor garage and I was, that's still my other big passion is motor car. We were sort of a third generation, um, uh, sort of family of, of motor cars, motor vehicles and motor garages and that. But, and I, that's what I probably would have wanted to do that. But my father was adamant that it's, it's one thing working on your own car. It's a whole different thing when you've got to work on someone else's sort of, um, you know, rubbish or whatever. And so the other, my other passion was, um, you know, I said, I'll be, you know, I'll go in and um, try and be an aircraft mechanic. So I went and sat my, my maths exam for Air New Zealand and, you know, failed that dismally. And my <laughs> mum, t- not far after, she just walked me around, you know, I was from Christchurch. We lived in Oxford, which is 30 miles out of Christchurch. And um, she just sort of, in those days, you're talking the 70s, um, just walked me into a, a hotel called the Clarendon and said, my son wants to do an apprenticeship. And I went, yeah, you can start tomorrow. But if we go back a little bit further, my mum was never that well and just, you know, that's just a fact of life. And I used to cook a bit at home. And as with, I think, anything or any anyone, you like to be appreciated. So I used to cook for the family or cook dinner and they'd say that was good and you'd do it again. So I, it wasn't as if I hadn't had some experience and I kind of fell into it like that, you know. Yeah. Do you remember those first uh, few years uh, working in a commercial kitchen and, and what it was like for you? Yeah, absolutely. I, I just there's some people, um, you know, that, that that leave a mark on you that you learned. It was, you know, it was fairly low level at that stage. You know, um, it perhaps, you know, wasn't a, a, a true passion. You know, oh, sorry, it was. I liked my job, but there was other things. I was racing go karts and doing all sorts of stuff as a, as a young person, and so it was my job, but it wasn't the be all and end all. So when I first went to the UK in 83 to 85, I was actually working at a place called the Crest Hotel in, in Brisbane, which became the Pullman sort of years later. And a friend of mine, Jim, had gone overseas and he'd, he was working at the at, um, the Rue Brothers. And uh, my other friend, David, had gone and he was working at the Dorchester. And they'd been there about, you know, six weeks or whatever. And they rang me up and said, you've got to get over here. This is just a whole different game. So I went, you know, got on a plane and... Um, I can remember my first job was at this menage a trois and we, we were sitting on, the, sitting on the steps waiting for the chef to come and open up. And this, these supplies came from some from France, some from, you know, from locally in London. And it was like 15 mushrooms and, say, 20 different lettuces and 30, unpast- 30 unpasteurized cheeses. And I was just sat there and thought, bloody hell, you know, I'm, I'm going to be flat out putting a name to this, let alone remembering them all and that sort of stuff. And you've got to remember, in 1983 in Australia, we probably had an ice, and well, certainly in Brisbane, we probably had an iceberg and a cos lettuce, and we probably had a field mushroom and a button mushroom. We're talking 15 types of mushrooms, 20 types of lettuce, and um, that's when something just clicked in my brain and thought, this is my life, this is what I want to do. And I really held that, you know, held that vision to come back and do the first restaurant subsequently echo in 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 85 and during that time i I would go and do stages which you know it's becoming less and less sort of acceptable because of people are worried that someone might fall over on your premises or something like that but a stage is you know is people go and do you know basically work experience it's a french term stage being on stage and um uh I used to go to the Ritz and do in the pastry section. I had a big passion for for pastry, and that's when I just sort of yeah, that's when I guess I, I sort of loved it and just held that that vision. I haven't actually tired of cooking to this day, which I think is amazing because I'm 62 now, whatever. You know. What was what drew you to Brisbane? Um, I actually came from. I kind of left when I was 21, really. So I, I consider myself Australian because. I only hold one passport, and I left New Zealand when I was 21, and I'm, you know, I've been here 40 years. Look, I worked around. I worked in um, in Sydney. I worked in Perth, and I guess really just I kind of like I'd, Christchurch is a pretty cold place, and I just migrated to the, you know, to the sun for no other reason. And it was from there, sort of a few years, I went to the uh, to the UK, and I'd left a um, a vehicle here, so I came back to here, and. Um, and yeah, and by the time I come back, I'd, I'd, I'd wanted to do a, a restaurant stuff like that. Yeah, Brisbane's uh, culinary landscape has evolved really quite beautifully 
Uh, what's some of the really key moments do you think over the last couple of decades that have helped foster such a great culinary landscape? I guess um, Expo 88 was the one that, that sort of showed people that it was okay to eat out on a Tuesday, Wednesday night. You know, prior to that, it was um, it was a bit of a Friday, Saturday night town, you know, so that sort of proved that, you know, that six months of Expo, you could, you know, it was fine to go to a restaurant any day of the week. So that, that was a bit of a change. Um, and and then, yeah, just, just people just doing um, serious food at accessible prices, I think, was, a, you know, was a, another great thing. And, and uh, I guess if I had now, if people say, what, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, one regret is that it is the entry level now into restaurants has got so high that, the people like I did who scraped something together to get their first restaurant, it becomes very hard f- for owner chefs to get a leg, leg up. They can probably come in with an investor, but that has its inherent problems and that sort of stuff. So, <clears throat> yeah, but it, I think it has become a vibrant city and there's just, um, uh, compared to, say, the openings in Sydney and Melbourne, there's just less people here. But, you know, I think we we, we punch pretty well for, you know, for the size of, what, of the city. Yeah. You mentioned uh, when you first opened, you took the tablecloths away and um, tried to, to cut costs and still have maintain excellence and you won Restaurant of the Year um, just a few years in. What sort of pressures did that put on what you were doing and did it change what you were doing at Echo? Yeah. Look, I guess um, if we just go back a little bit, when we, we opened, we just had this vision that well, I had this vision of what I'd seen in the UK and uh, PJ or Peter McMillan, who's got Harvey's now, he's my first chef, and we, we really believed in what we were doing, and it was all about flavour. And a lot of people say, let's use, you know, two or three key ingredients and, and do as little as possible with it. You know, you've heard that a thousand times, but you've just got to, you've got to actually do it. It's no, no, nothing is, no, you can't just say it. You've got to believe in it. But two, the interesting one is, is two years in, before we'd won Gourmet Traveller Restaurant of the Year, you know, th- we're actually the only restaurant still to have won that. So I guess I'm still hanging my hat on that one. And um, uh, two years in, PJ, myself, and myself picked up the um, the River Cafe Blue Book, and I just looked at it and thought, man, this is what I want to do. Like, we weren't that far off the mark, but it was just so, so simple what Rose Gray and Ruth Rogers were doing. It was just all about flavour. It was grey, it was grey. If it was green, it was green. This is all about, you know, what you see is what you get, blah, blah, blah. So within 10 days of picking up River Cafe Blue Book, I bought an airline ticket and I went to London and worked for a couple of weeks at River Cafe. And at the time, there was Jamie Oliver, who was just rank and file there. It was before he got his break with his first show. Um, ben who was there. Uh, Darren Simpson was there. So that I worked, you know, and I left there and sort of talked to Rose and it was just like, you know, someone would come over during a service and say, you know, do you want to put a bit of caps? For example, I don't know if this exactly happened, but this is the type of thing that happened. Put a bit of capsicum on a, you know, like a, on a crab risotto or something. And she would just look at them from, as if they're from another planet. <laughs> she could only see, see things that food, there was nothing for garnish. If it was a herb that might have added flavour, that's fine. You know, there is no way that you're just going to put something red on top of it to make it look pretty. So I, so I subsequently, we'd been sort of, you know, photographing our first book, and again, you could never do it these days. We were just getting a photographer in to take it. We were writing the recipes down. We didn't have a design or nothing. And when I came back to Australia, um, I said, oh, we're getting the tomato dice off the bloody, you know, mushrooms or whatever, and I've never put them back on since. So it was sort of, it was it changed the way... I thought about food. She, you know, Rose Gray, who's um, sadly since passed away, um, was just such a visionary. Obviously, Ruth was there as well, but Rose was really, to me, the, the one that def- defined what I saw in that. And, um, you know, just basically spurred, you know, uh, spawned so many great chefs and Jamie and C.O. Randall went on to do great things in um, in London and stuff. They just, it was just a platform there. Like when, when I was there for those two weeks, it was tomatoes and stuff coming in that if you'd got them in Australia, you, and this is even, we'd moved on now, we're in the 90s, you'd be so proud. That, that was being, you know, turned around because it wasn't quite up to their standard. They were just, and they weren't being difficult. They just, 
believed so much. Like they had the favourite um, olive oil called Silver Piano and they used to go every year to um, Italy, but they'd try the oil. If it wasn't good, they'd go somewhere else. It was just all about flavour, all about flavour and um, nothing else mattered. Like if it was a broad bean and it was just the risotto turned it out, turned out grey, that was what it was. It was just a different way to look at food and um, uh, it changed the way I thought. So I came back and we, you know, the rest is kind of history. We um, we won Gourmet Traveller Restaurant of the Year and that was sort of an interesting uh, experience in itself because they used to, in those days, there used to be one, um, one, you know, you buy the magazines and you could vote. So there was one way it was a people's choice, but then what happened used to people used to buy a lot of magazines. So they thought we were the first year that there was a people's choice where you could, you know, um, vote for the magazine. And there was a, a critic's choice and we got in on the critic's choice. Um, so there was two for every state and Rick Stein was the, was the judge. And again, sometimes you've got to stand in the right place at the right time. Had it been Robert Carrier or someone else, I don't think we, you know, which was a previous judge, I don't think it would have been us. But Rick Stein went to every, um, went to the two restaurants in every state and um, and judged them. And we got the invitation to go to Sydney and we thought, well, we're not going to win this thing, but we, know, I guess we just go and make up the numbers or whatever. Cut a long story short, we went to the awards. It was in on the, one of the, um, a restaurant in the park just opposite one of the museums there. And Rick got up and talked about, it, and in that year, there was Rockpool and Tetsura in the same award. Not that I ever think that that's going to be me, but I but I was proud to be one of the, you know, um, 12 final restaurants, whatever it was. So he talked about each restaurant he went to and and, um, uh, and his experience. And, and I, he sort of went through about 10 of them, and we, we didn't get a mention. I thought, that's just weird. Still not thinking anything, just thinking... I know we're not going. To, I know we're not going to win, but you surely think we'd get a bloody mention. And then he said, oh, "I went to this one restaurant, and the you know the the waiter uh, was talking about Madfish Bay, and he said where the fish get caught in the in the rocks at low tide, and they they struggle and they go mad. And it was, a, and he, he explained the story of the wine, which was Madfish wines, and I didn't know that the waiter had actually you know had actually said that to Rick Stein, so that went over my head. And then the next one. He said, oh, then I had just this food that was just very honest. It was just some calves that were with some mash. And I was thinking, yep, that could be anyone. And then he said, and then I had this um, Morton Bay bug risotto with fennel, chilli, and I, and it was sort of a dish that I'd seen at River Cafe, not with bugs, but with, a, you know, with another seafood. And I thought, holy shit, that's me. <laughs> and, then, and then it was sort of like, a surreal moment that you think, you know, this is your, your crack. And in those days, that those awards had so much meaning because there wasn't, you know, a ton of different awards. And I'll just give you one, you know, rather than rave on here, I'll just give you one little thing. We used to have an upright sort of freezer that stood in the kitchen because the first, Echo wasn't terribly big initially. It was about 60 and we eventually ex expanded it to about 85, 90. We had like an upright freezer and was, we had one of those old fax machines that, you know, it would spill out paper but wouldn't actually cut it off. It was just like a reel. And we came in the next morning and you, so you're talking something two metres high, you know, six foot high, whatever, or a bit over six foot, um, and the paper was hitting the ground with congratulations, bookings. And then, then it went kind of really silly. And this was another lesson in learning in life is that, is that uh, you don't want to sort of get away with your own hype, is that we were full on a Tuesday for – three weeks and full on a Friday, Saturday for three months. So there's a certain way that you can say that. So when someone rings up, you can say, we're full, bang, put the phone down. That gives a certain message. Or you can pick up the phone and say, we're really sorry, we are full. We can take a waiting list. We can, hopefully we can do something next week. You know, this, and we try to teach the staff this, you know, this, these sort of things won't last forever. So we have to treat it with respect. And I think, to the best of our ability, you know, I'm not saying we were perfect, but to the best of our ability, we did. And we just, you know, in the, it's so much so that people thought we were doing double sittings. We weren't. We were just sort of saying we've got nothing at 6.30, but I guess if someone's gone at 8.30, you can have that table. So we used to take bookings at any time rather than doing two sittings and then just try to fit around it because we didn't want to keep saying no because it wasn't. it's not a great um, 
you know, it doesn't send a great message long term. Eventually, people get sick of being told no. At some point, they want to, you know, perhaps get in. You know. Yeah. You mentioned the incredible uh, access to produce that inspired you over in the UK. Well, and produce is so important to what you do. How, how different has it uh, been watching the um, producers come on uh, come on in Australia and um, your access to better produce? What's it been like? Yeah, no, it's been fantastic. And early on, we'd get a little, you know, a guy called John Cutts would walk in with his sort of organic. He actually wasn't certified organic because it cost a lot of money to sort of be certified, but he was just one of those true believers that practised organics and stuff. And he and sometimes he'd come in and say, I've got this many, you know, whatever, you know, broad beans, sagini flowers, whatever. And we sort of felt it. We weren't the only ones that we, we owed it to ourselves, we owed it to him and we owed it to, you know, to, to basically take whatever he had so that he could survive. Otherwise, that sort of stuff, you know, doesn't go on. So, yeah, no, it has come on um, leaps and bounds. I still find the food industry, you've got to go and sort of sort, suss it out. Like if you take the wine industry, it's very sort of proactive. People come in with their wine, they show them their wine. Um, if you're not happy with it, they'll exchange it. You know, with the food industry, it's slightly different. If, you know, if you said, I said something wasn't good enough, they say, well, everyone else is happy, you know, why aren't you? And, but um, so what I've found, and even of lately when someone says, oh, have you tried this meat guy or this guy, other chefs will sort of put you in the right direction of what they think, who's doing the right thing. And I think that's how we kind of get onto it. We don't – and also – once we got a bit of a reputation, I guess people came to us and offered us stuff. So it was a little bit easier for us than, than some people would be trying to, you know, to, to tread their own path, trying to find out who had the – I mean, they could ring us and we would tell them, but um, people started to come through the door and say, I've got this, I've got this. And we, we you know, we were – again, we, we try, I tried to stay true to what I'd seen with Rose and, and just – we used to – I didn't care what people told me. We would sit down, we would taste it, we'd eat it, and if it was better, we would go. If it wasn't, we wouldn't. We're just not going to go because it's it came from a certain part of you know Tasmania, or whatever, and it was highly rated. If it was, we were all about what I'd seen at River Cafe: taste it, cook it, better. Yep, we're gone. Yeah. Is there any um, local producers that you can tell us about that uh, you utilise on the menu that um, you really love what they do? They, yeah, there's, there's been some local cheese guys and that, but recently, um, look, I've used Rennick Farm Quail from Tasmania for about 20, you know, 20, most of my career almost, and I love their product. But recently, uh, from the Brisbane Valley out sort of towards sort of Ipswich Way, these Brisbane Valley quails came on board, and they were just a fantastic product. They were a very large bird, great flavour, and, and, you know, Anton, my chef, he's a French chef who's um, – a really gifted chef, and um, he said, you want to try these? And I said, oh, I'll be, you know, like, I'm happy. We've been using Rannick Farm forever, and he went, you know, we, can we try them? I went, yeah, sure. And he cooked me one. I went, Pfft. you know, what are you going to say? It's local. It's fantastic. And you got, you got, you got to, you got to applaud that. It's not mean I won't ever use the others, but, um, uh, yeah, so, that yeah, there is, there is that sort of stuff. Mm. This episode is proudly supported by Montague. Handpicked for you. The things that we're really looking for in plums, first of all, they've got to be sweet. We're really looking for a full flavour explosion um, in our plums. Red flesh is critically important to us. Higher in antioxidants, so all that good stuff. And then we're also looking at a slightly firmer texture. So there's a little, almost a little crunch. You know, that's a real driver for us. For more information, go to montague.com.au. Two and a half decades is extraordinary for a restaurant. What's been some of the challenges over the years in um, maintaining profitability and keeping keeping up with um, success and the me- in the media? Well, we haven't always been as profitable as we'd like to be. Like when when we won Gourmet Traveller, you'd almost you know fall over yourself because there was so much sort of cash flow because of the how busy you were. You probably weren't watching everything else as much as you should. And then eventually if that shine comes off a little bit or whatever, you find how the costs are, you know, just so much. And that's when if chefs ever say to you, I don't care, I just want to have my own business, I don't care, you know, I just it's all about passion. Yeah, that's that's fine. But 
it has to be a business. Like if you're just going to get a wage and you're going to risk, you know, your house and money and someone else's money, <clears throat> it has to be a business. So, um, yeah, you, you, you've just got to be – it's so important now. And it's and also, you know, people that are thinking they're going into business is, you know, our current situation, we have a, a, a percentage turnover of rent, which has been just a godsend during COVID because we just – Paying a percentage of of not much, you know, and some I think landlords have got to they've got to come around to thinking that the first year we moved because we just moved three years ago from the city and we were paying not you know insignificant rent there and um, we've got this the deal now that uh, the first year we perhaps paid a little bit more on a turnover situation than we had in the city, but because we're at Newstead now, but. When COVID hits, we were totally protected. And I think landlords have got to, if they want a, you know, a tenant and someone to last, they can't just keep saying rent, rent, rent. If they take a percentage of what you do and they believe in what you do, and I know not everyone's going to be able to get that deal, it's certainly a fair, a fair way to go. But you're just on for what you're really asking is, is your food costs have got to be right? And the staff, the wages is the, the really hard one to keep on top of because wages go up and we'd all like to pay people more, I don't think anyone you see a lot about the wage theft and all this sort of stuff and i just don't you know believe that anyone's in there to, to exploit people it's just um sometimes you know the chefs just they, they work till the you know till the work's done but um what we did during uh before COVID, actually mary my partner uh she sort of said look the wages are so high we just have to sort of work out you know, the, sorry, the food cost is fine. The rent's fine. The only other sort of chink here is the is the um, wages. So uh, Mary sort of crunched the numbers and come up with it. If we did four days a week and everyone did their 40 hours or for whatever they do, 45 hours, inside four days, we could lose two chefs. Now, let's say that's $120,000, $140,000. It's very hard to take that out of a business. So, But what we did was we started working Wednesday to Saturday and – because we'd cut these two chefs, it started to become more profitable. And that's a very, you know, big lesson for people who are sort of getting into the industry. Sometimes it's all, it's not, you know, it's not whether you take 30, 40, 50,000 a week. It's not that, that's, it's an, it can be impressive numbers, but at the end of the day, and it took me years and years and years to work this one out, it's about the profitability. So if your number, if the end number's a bit less, but the profit's better, that's obviously the name of the game. But back to what you were saying, Anthony, challenges has, you know, staff is obviously the major one. We were lucky for many years with chefs because people wanted to come and work for you and, and that. So we had a sort of a stream of people that came through Echo and went on to do their own things, which, you know, is one of the things that makes me the most proud. But floor staff, we suffered like everyone else. It's hard to get you know, to find really skilled floor staff. If you take Europe, you know, you can do an apprenticeship in food service and um, it's a proper profession, whereas here it's all, you know, I'm a university student and I'm just going to earn a bit of cash on the way through, you know, and they're – and um, so, yeah, tr trying to find the right, uh, you know, floor staff is, is, um, is a very p big part of the business. The last year and a half has been incredibly challenging for so many, and you've just, as of t today, come out of a another lockdown. Well, what sort of impact has this had on on you personally in the last year and a half? Well, I think we've we've done pretty well, and I'm not going to you know sit here and, and and sort of say we haven't. But it, there's a lot of factors that happen. Like the key things with the um, the whole COVID thing was there was, there was a few things in play here. One was we managed to, um, you know, I hate the word really pivot, but anyway, we managed to come, you know, ex, you know, execute a takeaway menu and get it up really quickly. So it was sort of, you waited a couple of weeks, you kind of, it was a quick and the, the, the dead. Also, we were lucky that we had a good access and good, good pickup area because um, people could just call in and, you know, and pick up. Um, so that was a good for that. And had we been in the city, it wouldn't have been quite as, as good. And, you know, had a re have restaurants in a bit on the second floor or something, obviously it's logistically harder. The other thing was we, we did have a you know, like a delivery tablet hanging around for some, for a little venue we had outside once. And on the first night, we, um, uh, we worked out that, you know, 
it didn't work. For some reason, it didn't work. We couldn't get it to work. So we just sort of said, you've got, to, you've got to pick up everything. And then at the end of that night, it was a Saturday, maybe it was a Saturday night or something, we, we took 5,000. We were so impressed with them. That's wow. a lot of takeaway. Take and we thought <laughs> we'd gone through Deliveroo, it would have been three and a half. So we thought, we're not doing that again. And then what happened, it wasn't really frowned upon. It was actually, it was allowed. We said to everyone, you've got to pick up. And people, I think they were quite keen, you know, either the – the, the, the husband or the wife, whatever, to get out of the house, that, that getting people to pick up wasn't wasn't hard. They, there was a little bit of a, a little bit of a journey. So, and that's how we that's how we did it. And then again, we had to let some staff go, and we didn't get a, a heap of job keeper. And um, uh, you know, we didn't we didn't get a heap of job keeper, but because we had a few immigrant workers and stuff, but we just tried to give them what we could, and then they paid us back with loyalties when we came back on stream. We we were able to re-employ them and all that sort of stuff. And um, so, we, you know, we obviously didn't get hit as bad as New South Wales at, um, or Victoria, but also when they sort of said we're going to shut for 12 weeks, um, we you know, like I think people would be really surprised how – little reserve restaurants have in, in, in the kitty. And we sort of thought, how are we going to do this? And um, anyway, we managed, we managed to, you know, to, to get through and I thought, well, worries, you know, worrying myself to death is not going to fix us either. So we just got to give it our best shot and do what, and do what we can. And then as soon as we come out of lockdown, sort of people, everyone who, who'd sort of supported us sort of thought, well, you know, it's so great that what you did during the takeaway and then they they came back and filled the restaurant. And then I guess a byproduct of COVID was we decided we were going to um, to do a set menu, which we'd never been able to do, and no one in Brisbane really done it that successfully before. And we're just going to charge, you know, 85, whatever it is, plus you can have a, a wine option as well. And we're going to take a deposit, which pre-COVID, if you'd said to someone, I'm going to take $85 off you, even for a table of four, they would have said no way. So... Um, people become a bit more compliant and they were willing to and they sort of thought, oh, these people did a good job during takeaway. And they, so we sort of got, we come up with this concept again, you know, with Anton and Mary and myself, that we would um, uh, we'd change the menu every two weeks. We'd put it up on the, on the and it's like a five courses or whatever. And I think eventually when it, it just was so strong after COVID that, um, we didn't really need to do anything but the five course. Eventually, we sort of offered, gave a three course option Wednesday, Thursday. But we've kind of stuck to it um, this this far. Like, long, you know, down the track, we may do a set price, but <coughs> excuse me, give um, give a little bit of a choice on the entree and main out. Um, I mean, I could do uh, I, I could do um, set menus for the rest of my days. You know, we just. It was just it was, it was a, a breath of fresh air for me. You do fifty bread, then we do you know fifty salmon entree, and then we pack away all all the way that. Then we do fifty gnocchi, and we put that away. It was just glorious. But the chefs, you know, when you you forget when you're young and keen and hungry, they'd all be happy to go back to a la carte. And I'm just looking at them going, but it's more work. They just <laughs> it's nice to see that you know, they're still driven and they want. You know, it's a terrible chef trade. They want to make extra work for themselves. <laughs> Make make them feel worthwhile. I'm not sure. Do you think restaurants have changed forever because of the circumstances of the last year and a half? Look, I think so, and it's it's it, it it's. But um, look, we are doing the set menu thing. Other, I'm not about the people are, but I think it's really people have probably become to realise that you know it's part of the fabric and part of that you've got to support these. You want them to survive. You've got to support them, and the, there's been a change that people have that because you people have so much. Um, you know, choice out there. They can go anywhere, so you need the support. And the other thing is, since we started taking a deposit, which, uh, as I said before, it would have been hard to, to try to tell everyone to give you a credit card beforehand and everything. Since we take a deposit, if you cancel within 24 hours, you get the money back. If not, if you want to change inside that time, you you can move it to another date, but you probably don't get your money. You take a credit for another day. Anyway, um, our... Our, um, you know, no shows have basically gone to zero. So people, I think, and I'm not just sort of, you know, bagging the general public, but people sometimes, I'll, I've got to believe, they made, you know, a booking here and a booking there and whatever and sort of decided where they're going to go and they, they maybe they cancelled, maybe they didn't. But, you know, how do you go from having, a, you know, two or three, ca you know, no shows on a weekend on a Friday, Saturday to actually having none? It's because 
Uh, not that they're, fr- you know, it's just people have got, you know, they've got a commitment and that's what, that's perhaps the way it should be. You know, you, you put down your deposit. If you can't make it, you've got to tell us because, you know, if, you, if someone doesn't turn up for a four, you know, a restaurant could lose, you know, $600. Like that could be the profit for the whole night. So um, that cha- that's been good is that there's been a bit more, you know, um, it's kind of swung back and I'm not saying we got the whip hand, but it has swung back a bit that we're also telling you what we're doing and, and, and that, and that's fine rather than it all being, um, you know, the other way. Your influence on Queensland's uh, culinary landscape is, is incredible over a couple of decades. What is it that you love about what you do? <laughs> I don't know. I just I also thought you know if I if I get sick of walking through the you know the arches of your door I'm I'm going to have to give it away. I still love food. I love the execution of it. If you ask me, excuse me. If you ask me, you know, like if I'm if I'm over it at all, it'd be like if I had you know boning salmon and pulling sorry pulling the you know the pin bones out of salmon, you know, and boning ducks and quails. Yeah, that part of it. I can't. I don't love it to bits, but I mean, I'm still happy to pick herbs with the kids and that sort of stuff. So, um, but I still food generally excites me. When I see talent, it really excites me. So our current chef Anton, who's you know French, but he trained in London, blah blah blah, just has great taste and great feel and great. And I just admire that. Like over the years, you'll find people they're kind of a bit scared to employ someone that good, and you know perhaps he could take your job or something. Not. It was not going to happen with me because we own the business, but sometimes you'll see that in hotels or restaurants where they just – but always employ the very best you can. All the, the, the least they can do, they can just make you look good. So um, – and I'll tell you what genuinely excites me when I see people that are, that are genuinely gifted because you're not the only person in the world that's gifted. You're not the – there's other people out there. And when you, when, you, when you see people coming through, do you think, yep, yeah, he's got it. He's going to go all the way. He's got good flavour, good technique. And then you see other people and you go, you know what, you, you're just doing the same, you know, making the same mistake over and over. I just, you know. And, and, and another rewarding thing is sometimes you'll get someone in the, in the group, say you've got, you know, we've got two, we have two or three girls, one's a Chinese, one's from Korea, and one's from the Philippines, and uh, Anton's French. I'm New Zealander, but I'm basically Australian. We had an Australian girl, and she was perhaps the weak, you know, the weaker link. But because she worked with Des and, and Haley and all these these others, she kind of got it was that I've seen that over the, over the years. She got dragged along that her game. No one likes to be, you know, last of the pack. So she got dragged along. So that she was actually up to her game because she didn't want to be the weak link all the time. So that's it's nice when you see that because they that's it's growth not only for me and the business, but it's it's for them too. It's a learning experience. They're gonna they learn from that. Sometimes you've got to up your game. Otherwise, you're always going to be looked at as if, you know, guess what, you know, you, you know you're not kind of right for, for here, you know. Well, Echo is not only one of Brisbane's restaurants, one of Australia's best restaurants. What sort of advice do you have for someone young that's looking to open their first restaurant? I think the best advice is you just got to work for the right people. And when I, um, when people come to me and they have a CV, look, if they've got their qualifications and, I realise that you know done their their hygiene and their food safety. That of course means something to me, but at the end of the day, I want them to work for the right people. Of course, you can have the odd place where you worked at a hotel. It might not mean much, but but your CV really should show good people, and it should perhaps you know um, show more than six months. You know, years ago we used to think, oh, we want people to work a couple of years. That's not the case, but six months is not enough. So if you work a year here and a year there and two years there, that's fine. I don't, I don't have an issue with that. But people learn more from working from you know with good people, and that's that's just the name of the game. You know, if someone's worked for Ben Williamson, who's at Agnes now, and worked for you know people that I know around town, I'm going to give them a crack because number one, I can call them, and. Um, and number two, they you know they're making the they're making good choices, and um, and that's where you know that's where people are going to really succeed is just work for the right people. You know, you moved Echo a couple of years ago to a larger site, and um, you and you've got through COVID so far very well. Um, when we're on the other side of this, what, what are you most looking forward to? I guess these snap these snap lockdowns and that are they're a bit. 
you know, um, we haven't had, again, anywhere near as much as, as, say, Victoria. Sydney hasn't been too bad, apart from the, the latest one. But um, I guess I just want to run my restaurant, to be honest. I mean, um, uh, and same as the chefs. Like, they get, they don't mind doing the takeaway. It's not their thing. They do it really well, and they, and they, you know, an, I believe we've been doing things that other people didn't do, which was like a, a whole lamb shoulder that would feed two or three people. So just things that, you know, people can just take home and have enough left over from the sandwich. So we were, and plus it was a decent price point. It was $70 or $75. So it was, you know, we were, we sort of hit a market that not everyone was, do, you know, was, was in. <clears throat> but um, this week we were, you know, you, we would have gone very close to taking nearly as much in takeaway as, um, as the restaurant did, which is just amazing. But we didn't have, outside catering, which is a big part of our business, and we didn't have our private dining room, which is a big part of our business. So if you just, you know, oh, that's probably another thing, back to what you asked before, Anthony, if, you know, what advice can I give is it? it's very hard just to have an a la carte restaurant. You really need a few strings to your bow. Now, whether that's a private dining room, a little bit of a takeaway through part of the business, or like we've sort of really cult, uh, built a, um, an outside catering arm, you know, Philip Johnson Catering, so that and those sort of three things make it all it all happen. Like we'd always done a bit of catering for customers, and then and then a few years ago we actively went out out of that after that business. And we don't do massive stuff, but we do, you know, sit down could be twelve to a hundred, and and you know, savouries might be up to one hundred and fifty. But we're not. We just go for what we are good at. A lot of the functions are just a twelve or a twenty on a on any given evening, and um. It's just another income stream because the funny thing is, yes, there is a bit of food cost involved, but the prep can usually be absorbed in the working week of your chefs. So you think about that. So the, the labour can be absorbed just in their working week, yet obviously you're charging, um, you know, the, the outcater price and plus there's some, you know, labour on top of that when you go to the site, which you don't get with a restaurant. They just pay one price. You know? Well, um, you've – had an incredible 26 years with the restaurant. Um, what, what can we expect from you over the next couple of years? I'm not sure. I mean, <clears throat> at the moment, it's, I'd love to get to the business that, where the stage where you still have the business, but you don't have to be around it as much. But in saying that, um, I like being around it. And now that we've gone to four days, I'm thinking, gee, because I can do this for another few years. But it, it, look, it's been rewarding to me. It's been, I've had, you know, it's, You've had tough times and good times, but basically when when people come back, you know, and they say, oh, you know, we got – starting to make me feel old, but they say, oh, we got engaged at, you know, at Echo, you know, in, in 95, and it's like, you know, 25 years ago. Well, we've been married 25 years and we first came to Echo. So it's nice to think that people, they respect the um, – you know, your longevity and they respect that you still stand for what you set out to stand for. And that was pretty, you know, uncom uncompromising and, um, and quality. And at one stage you sort of think, am I, am I sort of breeding a, a whole lot of sort of food snobs? Cause they only want to use good olive oil. They only want to use, you know, a good salt. They only want to use a great vinegar, but it's not, it's, it's, it's about teaching them that your palate is everything. Your palate, your gift and if you're if you're a, a chef that really cares about his trade, you know you better hope you've got a good palate because that's everything. You know that's everything. Well, Philip, it's an absolute honour to have you on Deep in the Weeds today to hear your story, and I know there's so much more to it. Um, perhaps we can catch up again down the track a little bit after this. Absolutely, I'm I'm very happy, and um, thanks for doing what you do, Anthony. It's it's great to um to to re you know see and hear what's going on around the country. Well, um, please keep in touch and we'll catch up again soon. All the best. Thanks, Sammy. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.